intanto io vorrei dare il benvenuto sul palco al Marketing Cloud Senior Sales Manager Italy and Iberia di Oracle, Stefano Varasi. Benvenuto Stefano. Stefano, volevo partire con una domanda piuttosto precisa, perché abbiamo parlato di dati, no? E si parla tantissimo di dati nel marketing, però volevo sapere quali sono i dati rilevanti per capire quali sono le esperienze rilevanti, le esperienze che restano. Eh, guarda, i dati sono la materia prima di tutte le persone che, che sono qui in sala, per cui i dati, per fare un paragone, sono il nostro petrolio, e direi che in questo momento valgono più del petrolio, probabilmente, visto che i GAFA, quindi le quattro grandi società che in questo momento gestiscono la maggior parte dei dati, hanno una valorizzazione di mercato che è superiore al prodotto interno lordo di nazioni come Germania, Russia, Inghilterra. Questo ci fa riflettere su una cosa, cioè nel senso che laddove abbiamo una grande quantità di dati e quindi questo petrolio, proviamo a fare questo, questa relazione tra i dati e il petrolio, la domanda è se abbiamo le trivelle giuste per andare a prenderci i dati, quindi se sappiamo dove andare a bucare per prendere il dato pertinente che ci serve e se abbiamo anche dei contenitori che sono in grado poi di raccogliere questo dato, di eh, raffinarlo, che per noi vuol dire dargli valore, dargli un certo tipo di significato e utilizzarlo poi nell'ambito della comunicazione piuttosto che nell'ambito ovviamente dell'advertising più ampio. Il vero eh, trend in questo momento è quello di mettere insieme la gran parte di dati che vengono generati dagli investimenti in advertising, che normalmente poi vengono i dati stessi un po' buttati via, quindi le trivelle lì funzionano un po' male, rispetto a quelli che sono i dati delle aziende che devono poi incrociare queste informazioni per sapere come ti chiami, qual è il momento giusto per mandarti una comunicazione, cosa stai facendo in quel momento, sempre nell'ambito del rispetto del GDPR, ovviamente. Diciamo, per carità di Dio. E uh, ovviamente mandarti una comunicazione pertinente. Quindi il vero come dire, un po' per l'azienda che rappresento, è avere le trivelle giuste e dei contenitori che siano in grado di mettere insieme questi mondi, razionalizzando bene gli investimenti fatti precedentemente. Ok. E la relazione tra il tempo e l'esperienza in questa analisi? Eh, ma noi viviamo di, di micromomenti digitali. Cioè prendiamo decisioni di acquisto in tempi molto stretti, non magari per comprare un'automobile, ma per comprare altre cose. Abbiamo certo. questa abitudine a comprare anche in maniera veloce. Compulsiva. Quindi il micro momento compulsivo in realtà è, quello, è legato fondamentalmente al tempo, cioè il tempo fondamentale. Quindi laddove il dato mi esprime anche un'informazione che può essere legata al tempo, questo mi è utile per mandarti una comunicazione pertinente, certo. anche per risparmiare un po' in pubblicità, perché non la mando più a tutti, ma la mando soltanto a te. Quindi le parole chiave che possono essere questi micro momenti e il B2M, cioè la comunicazione fatta a me, che in quel momento diventa pertinente. Questo mi lancia un po' una domanda, magari per il prossimo panel, quindi a Costantin, di, di dire quant'è il valore del tempo nel dato, no? in modo tale da poter magari su questo aprire una, una discussione. Il valore del tempo nel dato, guarda, la giriamo immediatamente. Io intanto ti ringrazio Stefano, grazie, grazie a Oracle per essere stati con noi. Richiamo sul palco Costantin Camaras, che avrà seguito, immagino, l'intervento di Stefano Varasi. Did you pay attention to what he said? He had a question for you in your panel. Almost, I'm with you. Okay, now it's your floor. Fantastic. Feel free to invite your guests. I would be delighted to. Lo showman è Constantin per il momento. Thank you, thank you very much. Now, I was saying earlier how impressed I am about how this event is growing every year in terms of attendance and in terms of uh, the speakers that are present and I think There is no better um, proof of the growing quality and impact that the annual IAB Italy Forum has than the level of speakers it can gather, like for instance, this morning in a VIP panel on the value chain uh, where global leaders are attending a national event here in Milan to give you their views. So, i am delighted and indeed honored uh, to welcome on stage uh, with us this morning uh, Tina Boisler, the global head of media and agency operations of Nestle and a former president of the German Association of Advertisers. Hi, Tina. 
Vinit Arora, the Global Client President for the Dentu Aegis Network. Vinit. And Jean-Christophe Demarta, the Senior Vice President for Global Advertising for the New York Times. Welcome, Jean-Christophe. So, a big welcome to the three of you. Uh, it's an absolute privilege to have you with us this morning. Uh, we know you have very busy globe-trotting schedules, so we are delighted that you're with us. And as there's only so much time, I'd rather start uh, immediately uh, on the following topic. I've always been puzzled, and it, because this is something that affects the entire value chain, about what we call, for the last three years, the quality agenda. Three years ago, I think it was in January 2017, uh, at the annual leadership meeting of the IAB, the president of the National Association of Advertising in the US essentially put down a challenge to the industry uh, concerning issues of quality and transparency, viewability, ad fraud, brand safety, what have you. A very big challenge, a multi-pronged challenge, challenge indeed, and on which we as an industry have been working for almost three years now. So I would like a first comment from you on how far you think we've traveled uh, where we've done well, where there's still something to be desired, where do we stand, where are we along that journey? And needless to say, I will start uh, with you, Tina. Yes, so uh, thank you and ciao, everybody. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for having uh, us and me here. And uh, to my background, I'm from Germany, so my English is okay, I hope, so I hope uh, we can communicate well. So on the challenges, I would say the industry has improved, yeah? and I am a big driver of the digital transformation in our company together with many colleagues. Still, there are very many um, areas where we really still have to improve. So first of all, transparency. Yeah? We are not knowing where the money goes till today. Second, brand safety or brand suitability, as we say it. It's very important for our brands, for example, Bacci, Nespresso. We cannot be near to harmful content. Yeah? Three is all about user centricity. So I see more and more people out there um, avoiding advertisement, and that's not what we can uh, go for. Yeah? Number four, it's all about measurement. We need more measurement per platform, but also to implement measurement across and that we can plan, for example, holistically. Yeah? And last but not least, I think invalid traffic, fraud, all this, what is not shown to the people, we don't want to pay for that. Yeah, so we as an advertiser, Nestle, we really fight for those five areas and I hope many uh, here in the room can join me in this transformational uh, agenda that we need to get better every day. Yes, this is certainly, thank you Tina, this is certainly a clear drive from the brands and I think that the established players in the ecosystem have risen to the occasion and will continue to do so. Well, that's again my personal view. Vinit, uh, a first comment uh, from you as one of the major global players in the agency sector. Ciao, good morning everyone and thank you, like Tina said. Um, the issues are real and no one player in the ecosystem can solve this alone. So. Our role as an agency is to be a brand custodian or a trustee of investment and work with partners on the supply and demand side and work through this chain. Compared with a few years ago, there's more awareness amongst advertisers, agencies on the supply side as well that this is a real issue. There are solutions in place now, technical solutions that weren't available five years ago. I think the level of maturity is different, say it is in the West and you go far out East. 
Um, there are walled gardens in the West. There are walled gardens in the East. Um, from our perspective, of course, you have to be transparent. You have to work with clean supply chains, etc. But we've got to be able to provide visibility in terms of what is working spend and non-working spend, what is a fixed component and a variable component. And all clients, I think, are fair in their expectation that they want to get what they paid for. And nobody likes surprises. And I'll be honest with you, sometimes there are surprises on our side as well, and we've got to deal with that as a manner of doing business and building partnerships. So I don't know whether that gives you an answer, but what Tina says reflects, I think, a business and commercial view and a fair view. It's not an easy solution. In 2011, Lumascape had 150 players in the ad tech stack. Last year, 7,050. We, maybe we'll talk about this uh, uh, later, but where we were with programmatic in 2010, we're probably with addressable TV now, so the complexity is going to increase. Um, and just by way of concluding this piece, there was a CMO survey that I had a look at which said that 85% of CMOs thought that data that resulted in active, you know, um, actionable consumer insight was valuable. 50% thought they didn't have the technology to be able to get that. Um, and therefore, a lot of them thought that creativity was the answer. But I think all of this is connected, but we have to have a clean supply chain and we are an important part of that. Well, it, it's, I like the quote, you know, addressable TV is the new programmatic in, in, in that sense, which means it's going to be a very interesting ride. Jean-Christophe, a premium news brand, if there ever was one on planet Earth, and a pioneer in, in terms of doing, uh, making progress in quality and transparency. A first comment from you. No pressure. No. Um, <laughs> and thank you very much for, uh, for having me and the New York Times today. Great to be in Milan, uh, as always. Um, the, we've been on this path to quality for, for a long time. And as you say, we have a premium brand. We feel that we have a premium product. And the mission of the New York Times is to do journalism that is, that is worth paying for. So when you address an audience that, and you're asking people to pay for your product, the product has to be damn good. And that's what we've been doing. So we're at 5 million now uh, paying subscribers. Um, and we want to make sure that the product that we put out is as qualitative and it is for them as readers. And so we've taken a number of measures already on the site to have fewer ads, perhaps bigger, better ads, but fewer ads. And there are a number of things that we don't do because we want to make sure that the reader is protected. So the quality journey we're on that, and we think that this subscription business we're building is also good for brands. We do not have any plans at the moment to take out advertising, despite the fact that we're asking people to pay. We feel that advertising is part of the experience, and it has to be good, but it's part of the experience. So we don't think of a world without advertising on our product. But we're going to be taking this a step further, which is, and we've just announced, that we're going to remove all open exchange advertising from our app. And we feel that we have to go one step further in terms of quality. We feel that our app is the ultimate reader experience that anyone can have. And we want that to be as qualitative as possible. So we're removing all low-level advertising from that product to make sure that premium brands can take advantage and benefit of that. So this journey to quality for us is a must. We don't really have a choice. It's still a jungle out there, if I may say so. And, uh, and if we don't pursue this, and if we don't create this for our readers, but also for the advertisers that we work for, we don't think there's going to be much of a future. Interesting. First of all, thank you for breaking the news. Uh, you know, this, this is something that some may have suspected may happen, but it finally has. So thank you for breaking news. And as the New York Times go, often so goes the industry. So it's a very interesting development. I'm conscious of time because, uh, as I mentioned to you earlier backstage, half an hour with the three of you will go like this. So I want to keep track of time. Now, in my introductory remarks, uh, I mentioned the changing structure of the value chain, the accelerating change. And uh, I didn't say much because I didn't want to listen to you saying, oh, you got it wrong, Constantine, again. So I will leave it to you. 
to give me a comment on how do you see uh, the value chain changing uh, over the next 12 to 18 months. We've seen many things happening, like brands in sourcing, um, consultancies coming in and trying to find a place in the value chain, publishers investing in content studios that uh, win awards in Cannes, like the T-Brand Studio, which is something that usually agencies tend to do, last time I checked, but anyway. So, uh, a first comment, Tina, from you on the changes in the value chain, with a particular emphasis on, uh, on your position as, as an advertiser. Yeah, I would say uh, we are really in exciting times. Yeah? So, before, let's say, when I entered the advertising industry, we were mo mostly a triangle. We had the publishers, we had the agencies, and we had us advertisers. So, today, it's much more complex. So, between us, you know, we have thousands of other players. And uh, what does that mean for us as an advertiser? So we were used to give a lot of power and responsibility to our agencies to manage everything. And I would say these times are over. Yeah? So what we started and what I see from many other advertisers is that we need to bring more expertise in-house, it's media expertise in general, it's planning, it's also technology skills, it's data skills. We have, for example, search, Infra social, perhaps, in some infrastructure, infrastructure as well. Yeah? So we build, for example, not only dashboards, we go much further than that, and we have to have the right people internally and then to be connected with our partners. And these are really many today, much more than um, in the past. So I would say in general, it's a trend for more hybrid or for us collaborative setups where we as an advertiser need to take more ownership and responsibility on uh, what we do in advertisement. Yeah. Vinita, I, I, would have lived, I would have loved to be, you know, incredibly soft about this, but, you know, there's no way of doing it. You know, brands are doing more, many things, more things in-house. Uh, publishers are, are doing creative work. There are other people uh, that want to do agency-like work. A friend of mine, uh, a top international executive at an agency, says, you know, this is fantastic because it's very flattering. It shows that everyone wants to be an agency these days, which means you're doing something good. How do you feel in terms of the value chain as it is mutating and changing now and for the next 12 months? How do you read the situation? I think it's really positive for us, and I think we're on an upswing. It, you put it very well and directly. Um, look, it's complicated. It's more complicated than it was before. There are more players. There are many plug-and-play solutions. The entry barriers are lower. Uh, clients want more control, which is fair, which is right. Um, the battle, if you can call it that, uh, the fault lines are between ownership of data, who owns a consumer relationship, and it's multifaceted. So in a situation like this, where a lot of people can do many things. As an agency, we have to reinvent ourselves because there is still space for us to play profitably, transparently, honestly, with value that we bring to our advertisers or to our clients. So principally, we're not against in-housing. In-housing doesn't mean we lose our jobs. It means our roles change. 10, 15 years ago, it varies by market, but digital was a very small component. It was a department within a department if you had a department. Um, today, it's close to 50, 60, 60%. Agencies are still alive. We've thrived. There are new entrants. Old ones have gone. New ones have arrived. So I think as long as you're dynamic and as long as you're pragmatic and you're building this partnership with clients and suppliers, I think there is a place. It's easier said than done. Um, but the World Economic Forum, for example, says that this is, we're in the third phase of, they call it digital disruption, the media industry. First was Google with search, second was Facebook with social, and now it's personalization. And every client will need us to play some sort of role. It might be a little or large, but there is something for us to do. Jean-Christophe, 
you know, uh, the New York Times started from print and had exactly the same value chain for more than a century. How do you read uh, the current situation? Again, how do you see it evolving from your perspective in the next year or so? So, as, as you mentioned, um, T Brand Studio, our uh, sort of our uh, creative sort of unit, um, we, we've we've adapted to to the market to a market demand. Uh, you know, when we launched T Brand Studio, and uh, content marketing always existed, but the internet and digital provided brands with and publishers from possibilities to engage differently, and perhaps more profoundly with readers. And so we've all created shops, every publisher now on the planet is, has its own sort of creative studio. And that has brought definitely value to us. And we're going to continue. There is still demand for it. Um, it's, it's still growing nicely. Um, and so it's true that we've um, equipped ourselves with an internal agency. So in many ways, the question is that are, are we doing the work that traditional agencies are doing? From a creative standpoint, perhaps, but we're never going to be, become the agency of record for, for Nestle, for example. Uh, we are, that's, not in a, that, that's not an objective. What we're doing is applying what we know best, which is journalism, and we're applying those techniques to marketing to address an audience that comes to the New York Times to read the New York Times. So if we address them, if the brand addresses this audience in a similar way than what you know, our journalists do, then maybe that has value for brand. And that's what we're doing. The other thing is that what we are observing, and there is a question, it was interesting, one of your sort of predictions is that there's going to be consolidation. Um, what is interesting is that right now, the production that we do is only distributed on our own channels, for the most part. And, and I think that there is, there is a sense, uh, it makes sense, because you address the New York Times, or if, when you build content for the New York Times, you would not build the same content on Vogue. For example, it's different, different audiences, different context. So I don't think that we'll compete. I don't think that there is, uh, there is a way of competing. Now, we're going to continue because the market demands it. Content marketing is predicted to continue to grow at about 10, 15% year on year for the foreseeable future, depending on the source, 10, 15%. Traditional advertising grows about 4 to 5% overall. So it's probably, you know, it probably is still a good area to invest in. The thing, though, is that it comes at a cost. And of course, if you want to produce content and you want to do it well, it comes at a cost. Um, and traditional advertising, as, in me, as we call sort of media display, is still far more perhaps valuable, profitable for us. Uh, but that portion is under massive pressure. And Tina mentioned measurements and performance. And, and of course, there are, there are huge questions around that. that particular side of the business need, needs, needs more attention because right now that, that is where it's a little, bit, uh, a little bit more difficult. I would like, uh, as we're entering the, the final part uh, of this panel, um, I would like to be a bit journalistic about things and uh, just ask you if you had to name one major challenge, not two, one major challenge and one major opportunity. You have to think, you have to choose, you know, I'm taking your mic if you're going to say a second one. One challenge and one opportunity, the top challenge and the top opportunity in your mind as a brand agency and publisher, what would that be and why? So as to create a sense of hierarchy and a sense of uh, uh, what is more pressing and less. So. Perhaps, Tina, you want to go first and see the one challenge that you consider to be most critical and the opportunity you consider to be, in the short term at least, yeah. uh, most interesting. Yeah. So I can tell you 10, but I uh, stick to the brief. I have to stay with yeah. one. So I would I'm going to be very German about this. Yes, so OK. You. German and Swiss. Mean, exactly. You can be both. Um, challenge. For me, the challenge really is when I look um, out of this room, um, how are we going to engage with the people out there in the future, with the new generations, with their lifestyles, with their um, habits, with their behaviors, with their uh, emotions? Yeah? So how are we going to do that? We have a lot of opportunities, I know, but um, 
how does this look like? That's where we really uh, are keen on understanding and we are really working on that. So when it comes to opportunities, I would say we have fantastic people working for Nestle. So as you know, we have digital acceleration teams. We have recently opened a digital media center of competencies. We have great teams in every country. So this morning I spoke to my Italian colleagues here. And I would say these um, people working for us, also partners, they make the difference, yeah? And this is for me a, a huge opportunity to collaborate internally, externally with our people, with our Global Media Council. You know, this is a leadership team uh, we have set up and to drive, test and learn, and also the agenda as an advertiser. It's very interesting what you say because in those industry fora that, you know, we attend, Usually, you know, the conversation very quickly goes to tech, tech this, tech that, tech the other, ad tech, martech, fintech, you name it, tech. And we forget how critical talent is and the competition that actually we have for talent. So recruiting, training and retaining talent, as you say, is absolutely critical. We shouldn't forget that. We shouldn't become tech obsessives and forget you know, the talent factor, particularly in the communications industry, absolutely. And talent is key, yeah, we know that. If we lose important people to our competition or to the agencies, it's really very bad. And therefore, we really want to attract talent, keep and integrate and motivate our people. Yeah? That's the most important. Vinit, the agency perspective. Not surprisingly, the advertiser's challenge is our opportunity. Because where advertisers see a challenge, it's our job and our role and our opportunity to make sure that we provide solutions as we can. Um, and the opportunity for us, if you were to land it, is to elevate our participation with clients' businesses, to make sure we're a true contributor to their business and become a true business partner. And this is easier said than done. Um, consultants historically have had you know, a higher place in the value chain as ourselves. But now a lot of people do many things, and our job is to make sure we prioritize the right things for our clients. So a lot of clients, Nestle is at the top of that list, um, are, you know, are huge forces for good, um, and they have their ways of working. And if, when you understand as an outside partner what is important, there's a huge slew of work that has gone on before it even lands on our desks or at our doorstep, and we have to then prioritize it and translate it into actions and make a difference to their business. Of course, underpinning that is tech, problems with attribution, uh, you know, the skeptical or cynical side of our business, etc. We have to navigate all of that for our clients and simplify the complex. So that, in a nutshell, is the opportunity, the challenge. Yeah, I thought you were going to skip that. And no, I was no, going no. to remind you. The, the challenge is how we do it. Yeah. Because today, if we commoditize our product, one, there are other people who can do it. Two, you will forever be challenged on you know, um, cost accountant type pricing and modular pricing, which is fair if you're, if you're buying discrete units and you want to provide a price for that, that is one point. But if we're, if we're able to transform what is input to us and output that we provide, that's the value that we're able to bring. And it's easier said than done. We don't do that in every market. We don't do that for every client. But that, I think, has to be our North Star. Very quickly, if you look at, you know, we're in a world of uncertainty at the moment. However, in the last year, ad spend grew by roughly 4% globally, you know, across the four main geographies. The growth was coming from programmatic and addressable, performance video, which plays to, DC, you know, dynamic creative um, and DCO and tech, and marketplace optimization. So all of this wasn't as scalable a few years ago, and we have to reinvent ourselves. The business goals stay the same for the client. The publishers are doing what they're doing. We have to navigate that, become, as Constantine said, we have to become the brand trustee. I will, I will leave the last comment to, uh, to, to Jean-Christophe. Uh, so, um, thank you for this. Um, we, I, th I think there is a formidable um, challenge, and I will start with that because I think it can transform into an opportunity for, for publishers. 
Interestingly, um, IAB France has a similar forum on Friday, and one of the session, um, I think it's so interesting, similar to this one, says display, will quality pay one day? And I think in, in the title of that session, I think it says it all, is that there is, there is still, the jury is out there still, whether quality will ever pay back in, in, in terms of advertising. We think it will, and as I, as I you know, explained uh, before. But right now, the market is, is super crowded from many publishers, of course, new websites, ad tech. It's still very, very crowded. Many of them will probably not be around six months from now, a year from now, but it's still sort of disrupting the, you know, the, uh, the business. So when you think of the New York, the publisher like the New York Times, we have an incredible brand. We've built this incredible product, 150 million users, 5 million paying subscribers. Our ad business on display should be like this. It is like this. So right now, there is something out there that is still not quite right. And we need, and I think it comes in how we judge performance and what, how you know, marketers and, and big advertisers uh, and their partners judge performance. So we need to somehow figure out a way of proving that all of this is super efficient, can work for Nestle and many others, and, uh, and I think there lies the opportunity for us. We perhaps need to come together as publishers more, think about this, being a little bit less reactive to what is happening around us, maybe be more proactive, but we need to find something there in terms of you know, ad efficiency because that, that's probably where the, uh, the challenge is right now, but the opportunity is as well. You're absolutely right. I think re-examining and redefining metrics and finding new forms of partnerships and working together is going to be absolutely crucial. And it is a discussion that we'll continue to have both during uh, this forum but in, in, in the coming months. We have a heavy agenda, but we look forward to tackling it. I would like to thank you most warmly, the three of you. A big thanks to our VIP panel. Please. Tina, Vinit, Jean-Christophe, thank you so much.